Hello, everybody, and welcome to Insights 2021, the key to human-driven market research. I'm Lima Widmer, Vice President of Market Research at Suzy, um, where we partner with hundreds of the world's leading brands to help connect them with customers qualitatively and quantitatively in a way that allows them to make agile business decisions in a fast-changing, rapidly evolving marketplace. I'm very excited to be sitting here with Phil DeConte from Ferraro uh, and to talk about some tips and tricks in survey design and really just to learn about his career as an institution. So welcome, Phil. And why don't we start by uh, sharing a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got to where you are today. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me and also to, to Susie. I always appreciate the the opportunity to connect. Uh, as you said, I am Phil DeCanto. I am the Vice President of Category Management and Shopper Insights here at Ferrero USA. Uh, so my, my team is responsible for uh, both headquarters and field category management here for, uh, for the US business. So we work on developing platforms and selling stories to support the category growth uh, within the different categories of sweet packaged goods that we participate in. Uh, so we partner with brand and trade marketing in the development of go-to-market plans, uh, innovation prep, seasonal selling, and other initiatives uh, of, of that sort, uh, and then partner with sales to customize and to uh, develop the message and the materials that fit the needs of our uh, individual retail customers and channels. That's wonderful. I, I understand you've been there for about five years now. Uh, tell us how, what brought you to Ferraro. Sure. Well, I, you know, I think Ferrero was a growth organization, which to me was very appealing. Uh, I, I think that uh, that growth manifests in a number of different ways that attracted me to the organization and uh, I think have attracted a number of uh, people into, into Ferrero. I think first and foremost, uh, the, the most obvious one is sales growth, right? So uh, we continue to deliver on plan. Very, very proud to see the the business performance that we've been fortunate to put up the last uh, five plus years. Uh, you look at category growth, we're delivering, I think it's eight times our fair share of uh, chocolate category growth, for example, over the, the last five years uh, in excess of $420 million worth of growth that we've added to the to the chocolate category. So just one example certainly could speak to uh, the other categories as well. But so I think that, that's certainly one plank of growth uh, here at Ferrero. Uh, another one is organizational growth. So uh, our organization has grown by leaps and bounds over the last five years. Uh, I came in in uh, the middle of 2016 uh, to lead a, uh, at the time, smallish uh, category management team that has now expanded uh, to, uh, we've recently hired our uh, 19th category management team member. Uh, we've seen similar growth within other uh, functions, other departments. Uh, so. It's, uh, great to see the organization growing, also great to see the resources of the organization. So we've been able to add different capabilities of the past couple of years to, you know, continue to unpack and uncover the, the opportunities in, in the marketplace. So that's, that's great. And then uh, finally, but certainly not least, is the uh, individual growth opportunity here at Ferrero. So uh, this is a great organization to get to make your mark. Uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we're working on, we're, we're figuring out for the first time or we're developing new, we're developing fresh. We like to think that uh, we have a fresh perspective on the categories that we're in. And I think that's a great opportunity for individuals to come in, uh, learn by doing, and develop those, those new skill sets. So, again, uh, growth, growth all around. That's a, quite a lot of growth that you're responsible for, uh, Phil. And so I have a really a two-part question for you. You know, thinking about the last five years you've been at Ferraro um, and the evolution you've seen in your team and the teams that you support, how have you seen the industry of consumer insights change and evolve in these past five years? Or even taking a step further back since you really became an insights professional, you know, what have been sort of the big um, changes that you've experienced and seen? Sure. I think one is the access, the democratization of data that uh, there was a time period, um, you know, perhaps 10 or 15 years ago where whether it was systems capability or resources that, uh, you know, or, or just maybe ID 
count uh, that uh, the, the access to the data, the access to those insights had to be limited for a variety of reasons, whether it was skill set or, like I said, strict, strictly availability of the, of the information. I think now we, we work with a number of partners who are, I think, doing a great job of democratizing access to that information throughout the organization, uh, which I think can, can have a great value to providing one version of the truth, right? How do we all look at the same information? How do we kind of gather uh, the same, uh, gather a similar perspective? And, you know, there certainly can be and will be differing points of view on what that information means, but, you know, agreeing on a line that this is the number that we're looking at, I think, uh, I think is really helpful. Uh, another uh, significant change uh, is the, the progress of technology. Uh, you know, technology continues to march on, and one of the ways that we see that benefiting us positively is speed. Uh, that there are things, and, and I, I think we're going to get into this in a little bit, uh, that uh, potentially took weeks or months to accomplish uh, in the past, that now we can whittle that time down to, if not quite real time, near real time uh, reaction. And I think that can have a real value add uh, in, in, in order to both initially influence the, the understanding of, uh, of, you know, of um, uh, whatever, whatever you're working on within a particular project, uh, but also can influence your hypothesis process, right? That I think that there are projects that, or, or elements of projects that you would have, uh, you wouldn't have taken on knowing the time lag relative to the, the need to act. Right. And now that again, that that time lag is narrowing the ability to investigate something before you have to act is is an advantage that I, I think we're starting to see now and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll continue to, to realize in the future. So the democratization of data is a very interesting term that you use. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So uh, I, again, I work within category management. So we, we rock, work cross-functionally across trade marketing, across our brand organization, and then, of course, across our sales organization. So I think there was a time period uh, in the, you know, in the, the 90s and the 2000s where, again, um, a, a lot of data was, was restricted. Uh, again, not not in an effort necessarily to keep things from people, but again, just out more out of necessity, out of, out of you know, systems necessity. Now we're in a position where we can publish a lot of materials and everybody can see them, right? So that that way there's no uh, there's no Wizard of Oz, you know, man behind the curtain con controlling the data. I think everybody can see that data. Everybody uh, can can hopefully learn on their own, can uh, you know flex their own. Uh, insights muscles, and I think the real value that can add is that a good idea can come from anywhere, right? And as much as I, I take a, a great amount of pride in the, the ability and the skill set of our category management team, I love to hear from the sales organization, from the brand organization, from the trade mar marketing organization, because the, the, the idea, the thought starter, the, the hypothesis really can come from anywhere. And the more people that we have looking at that information, the more likely that they're going to have that spark that we can then collectively dig into. That's really interesting. And I always think about the Suzy platform as democratizing access to consumers, right? And that's part of this whole process, right? So thinking about designing questionnaires, having access to do that um, and having the platform to do that, you know, what are some things that you can talk about in terms of um, best practices or designing questions or surveys that have uh, the consumer or the customer um, in mind? Sure, I think uh, one, of the, one of the big ones is consumer friendly language. Uh, we, um, we, you know, we, we, we've spent a fair amount of time in this industry, right? And uh, I think CPG professionals and especially uh, insights professionals can get very used to lingo or jargon, right? Uh, I, I think every, uh, I, I, I've, I've worked on the manufacturer side, everybody uh, uh, has a, a acronym dictionary of some form or, or function. And it, it's very easy to forget that the, the consumer that uh, is shopping our aisle, is shopping our product, isn't going to be up to speed on the, you know, the, 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 the segmentation that you stare at every day or the, 
uh, you know, the product pack type language that you use. So I think making sure that you're wording it, it's not dumbing it down, right? The consumer is very intelligent. They just don't have the, the level of experience with the, the specific terminology. And I think if we, if we make the questionnaire too uh, confusing, too inside baseball, then I think you can turn off the respondent and that, that, that can probably bias the, the results that you're gonna receive. Yeah, very, very good point. And I know that um, part of the Suzy platform is access to its panelists, which we actually call members, right? And and in that, there's a responsibility to keep our members engaged and connected and keeping the survey short and sweet and using consumer friendly language is important. And also thinking about, you know, the way you set up questions, there's some basic question hygiene that every person who's accessing a platform like Suzy should keep in mind because we do want to make it user-friendly, easy for people to understand and not be leading. Um, I'd love to hear from your perspective how having access to a kind of um, platform like Suzy can help you make these kinds of agile decisions. Sure. So I think, um, uh, you know, first off, to, to go back to the, the point on, on um, survey design or, or questionnaire design, I think you're right that there's a, there's a level of responsibility, especially I, I really like the do-it-yourself uh, functionality that, that we're working at, but there, there is a level of responsibility. You can get into a garbage in, garbage out type of scenario pretty quickly, and, and that, can, that can go down one of two paths. One, is, you know, that we were talking about, uh, if you have the absence of consumer-friendly language or if you have a confusing or maybe a, a you know, a lengthy uh, survey, I think you can, uh, you, 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 can, you can ultimately end up negatively biasing the results simply because the, 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 the member or the respondent doesn't necessarily uh, track with, with the questionnaire itself. I, I also think there's the potential to begin with the end in mind, right, and to have that outcome that you're seeking bias the, the actions. And I think it's really important to, to watch the phrasing, watch the terminology that you're using in that questionnaire design to make sure that you're, you're allowing the consumer to truly provide their perspective as opposed to perhaps leading them down a path uh, or, or towards an, an outcome that, that you're seeking or that you're expecting, right? There, there is a certain amount of um, uh, there, 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 there's a certain amount of, of care that I think we have to take there to make sure that there is a great credibility to both the results you're seeking, but also the, the, the platform itself. But one of the things that we do here at Ferrero is that we have, uh, we have a, a, a gatekeeper, right? So we, uh, we, we will allow for uh, different teams to assemble those questionnaires, but we do have one person who will ultimately uh, upload uh, the materials to, again, Double check the, the the phrasing and the you know uh, do do a consumer friendly language check things of that nature just to it, it creates a bit of a bottleneck but I think the, the upside to that bottleneck especially where this is a a, a newer capability a, a newer process for us uh, it, it allows us to quality check uh, because again the the credibility the integrity integrity of the results is is really critical um, and then uh, for the, the the second half of of your point there I think. You know, again, there's there's an opportunity now with the near real time turnaround to be in a meeting on you know it's it's, it's Monday morning right or Monday afternoon depending on where you are in the uh, in the world uh, and uh, everybody probably is sitting through meetings where we are um, uh, talking through whatever the whatever the challenge of the day whatever uh, you know what, wherever the gap is uh, in in consumer understanding. Uh, for for the project that you're you're involved in, and the opportunity to say, here's a thing we think we know, or we'd like to know more about, and then get that into the hands uh, of uh, of the consumer and allow them to to answer those why questions for us, uh, or allow them to tell us we're we're misinterpreting. Uh, I think can be really helpful, and and again, uh, the the speed to insights value there, I think, is is really valuable. Yeah, so you, I think you've answered a good part of my next question, which was really about, you know, what advice you would give to, you know, a DIY client such as yourself. So it sounds like you have um, a process for funneling questionnaires through someone who does a quality control check. 
Is there anything else that you would give as advice and for other clients who want to be on the DIY side? Sure. So I, I would certainly, I obviously, um, uh, you know, based on the, the, the vendor relationship, I, I would certainly leverage uh, any, uh, any coach uh, or rep representative support. Um, uh, the person we, we work with at Suzy is, is outstanding and provides a, a, a level of guidance. Uh, right. That uh, again, I think it's, it's appropriate with our uh, our contract, but I think really helps there as well. Uh, I think we're we're also uh, rolling out a, a sort of um, a questionnaire bible, right? A how to and how not to uh, that I think will will go a long way. The the idea again uh, is is speed, right? So I think we we want to make sure that we're not uh, we, we we ideally don't want to make mistakes at all, but we certainly don't want to make the same mistake twice, right? Uh, you know, this should be a learning and evolving process. Uh, we reserve the right to get better. Um, so let's let's learn from what we have uh, tried to this point. Let's get that in writing. Let's teach people about what worked and what didn't and, you know, continue to evolve. That's fantastic. And the other piece that you mentioned is the speed of information, which is one of the things that really attracted me to make the transition to Suzy is sort of the, the agility and the speed of the platform, but then also integrating qualitative and quantitative information. Um, this test and iterate feature and functionality of an agile platform is very exciting because you can move very rapidly. Do you see this um, as being an integral part of your relationship with Susie and then helping you work with your business partners? I do. Um, you know, I, I, I really like finding the right way to mix qual and quant, right? Uh, I think that we have a number of great uh, data providers and resources that we work with uh, that answer what questions for us very well. Um, but again, that, that, that's only half of the equation, right? If I'm reading through a consumer decision tree or, or whatever, the, whatever the data set is that we're looking at, I think that's, that's very interesting information about factually what the shopper's behavior was. But I think the opportunity to ask them why is, is really important. Uh, and uh, in particular, I, I like the idea of triangulate, triangulating uh, around an insight, right? So, you know, if we, again, uh, if you have that spark, if you have what you think is that, that golden nugget insight, uh, how, how great is it to be able to spot that from multiple vantage points, right? So, you know, work, work with a data provider on, uh, you know, on, on evaluating the, the, the what elements of it and then be able to work with a different provider to, to fill in some of the why gaps so that, again, hopefully across a number of different platforms or capabilities, you're seeing different sides of the same insight. Uh, and, and then that's where you start to feel like you have a fundamental truth. So, yeah, that, that mixture of the what and why, I think that's um, – that's something we're seeking. And, and again, I think the partnership with Susie has been a great start for that. That's exciting. Um, I'd, I'd love to go back to guidance for insights professionals, if I can, for a minute. Putting on your, your mentor or your coaching hat, if you were to talk to a young insights professional, somebody starting out their career, what would you tell them as sort of some core um, advice in terms of furthering their career within um, insights? Sure. Um, you know, I think one thing is I'd be prepared to challenge the norms, right? Uh, you know, what is what is the conventional wisdom specific to your category, specific to your space? You know, there's, you know, that old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not here to advocate um, uh, overturning any apple carts, but I also think that that can be a pathway to stagnation, right? So ask why a lot. You know, why is it we do this thing? Why is it we, we don't do this thing? Uh, you know, develop a hypothesis around, you know, why, how, how this thing that you're observing could be better or could be done differently, and then find the right way to test it. And, you know, I think that that, that curiosity is, is hopefully one of the things that drives a lot of people into the insights and analytics space in the first place. You're, if you're a curious individual, then the, the, the next natural outcome of that is to say, why, why is it that we do things the way that we are doing things in the category or in the space that you're in? Uh, and, you know, follow, follow up, right? Uh, and I, 
you know, I think a, another point of that is um, the opportunity to spend time in the, the real world, right? How do, you, how do you find something within the data set, right? You know, within your, your, your POS data, your panel data, uh, you know, within survey, within what, whatever the, the different resources you have at your, at your disposal, and go and, and observe that in the, in the real world. What do the real marketplace conditions look like? I think, um, you know, sometimes uh, you can get very uh, data-centric, of course, and that's, that's certainly not wrong within the insight space, but going and seeing what it really looks like on the shelf, what it really looks like for shoppers to try and buy the product, uh, you know, I think can, can add a, a real-world layer uh, that, that hopefully helps the storytelling uh, when uh, when it when it comes to us. That's great. And any cautions or watchouts you'd give them? Things that you've seen may, that may have been mistakes or things that you would say to learn from going forward. Uh, I I don't know if mistake, but I, I I like you know as you said, learn from right. Like the you know we're I, I think that there is there's a um, there, there can be a bias within the insight space to be the people that need to know the answer, right? And, you know, and it can be very jarring to say you don't know the answer and that you need to find out the answer or that you, you tested something and that was not the answer, right? Uh, I think, uh, you know, having an open mindset to, you know, how, how are we going to learn about this challenge? We're, 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 we're con confronted with a, a business performance challenge. Uh, how are we going to learn? There is a solution right? Uh, if, you, if you believe in puzzle solving, there is a way that all of these pieces in the jigsaw can fit together uh, and the picture can look the way that you want it to. Uh, you probably, in that puzzle, will pick up a number of pieces that aren't the right fit initially, right? And it's just a question of, again, uh, uh, learning, from those, uh, learning from those first steps and uh, applying that reasoning until the, until the picture ultimately, uh, ultimately matches. Yeah, and to build on that just a tiny bit, Phil, maybe even being comfortable in pushing back when survey research may not be necessary um, or not the right path, right? Because sometimes when you talk about triangulation of information, all the pieces may already be there. Um, and so being comfortable enough to, you know, say no when no is appropriate, right? Sure. I, I, I like to think that we build here at Ferrero a category toolkit, right? That there's there's a number of resources. Uh, the organization's been um, uh, fortunate enough to, to fund a number of toys uh, for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at those, uh, those items, you have to try and see a hammer and a screwdriver and a wrench, right? And uh, there are tools that the hammer is good for, and there are, there are or, or, or there are tasks rather that the, the hammer is good for. And then there are tasks that you probably wouldn't want to take on with a hammer, right? And I think understanding what is the appropriate uh, use uh, and, and, you know, and there is always stretch within that. Uh, and, and again, there, the resourcing of the organization obviously matters in that, but, uh, but I think using the tools effectively and, and for the purpose they're intended for is, uh, is, is a big part of the recipe. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I would love to get into where we see the future of insights going, but before we do that, is there anything else you'd like to share around practical um, tips and tools with survey design? Anything that um, an insights professional, even someone who's not in insights and marketing, who's looking at a DIY platform should think about um, as they go to, you know, stare at this blank sheet of paper and is preparing to write a survey, right? I think you've mentioned some really great tips already around, you know, avoiding jargon and, and using, you know, customer centric language. Is there anything else that you think might be a really low hanging fruit tip or trick that someone should think about? Sure. I mean, I, I think, it, and I'm, I'm probably just doubling back to the original point, but I think trying to put yourself in the in the shoes of, of the member of the respondent, right? Maybe one way to do that is the next time you're in a store, uh, walk to a category that you don't participate in, right? So if you're uh, if you're in the food and beverage space, maybe go take a look at the toothpaste aisle or something like that, and think through how 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 you understand that space as a consumer, right? You know, you certainly 
uh, uh, buy items within this space, uh, you, you shop this space, but you don't have the insider's knowledge um, uh, that, that you do about whatever your respective category is. And I think if you can take that perspective into your, your questionnaire design, you could probably, uh, again, develop uh, a, a series of, of questions that are going to get to the points that you now, again, within your, your, your expertise are going to, to want to understand, but in a, it, again, in a language, in a terminology, in a flow that is going to fit that, that consumer-friendly uh, space. Wonderful, thank you. And I, I always um, advocate for um, pre-testing a survey, you know, try it on somebody who's not as intimately familiar with your category or your space, um, just to make sure that the flow makes sense, that the logic makes sense, that um, you've checked yourself um, on, you know, jargon and even potentially leading questions and things like that. So, you know, if you have the ability to, you know, Pre-test, meaning run run the survey by somebody who's a little bit of an outsider. It really does help strengthen the survey design as you're ready to start inputting it into the platform. Um, wonderful. Phil, t talk to me about where you see um, your vision is or where you see the insights industry evolving to in the next five to 10 years. Sure. I, you know, I think it's a really exciting time and we're at a really... Um, interesting horizon, especially as, as technology continues to play a role in this space. Um, you know, the, the promise of different technological advancements here, uh, I think allow us, again, we talked a little bit about the democratization of data. Um, I also think there's probably room in the, in the, in, in, you know, in the years to come where we can free up human beings to be the, the interpreters and the actors upon that data that, uh, you know, hope, hopefully, uh, you know, there's, um, uh, there's, there's, you know, lingo uh, around, um, you know, pulling data, gathering data, right? That somebody has to be the person that rounds up the numbers, so to speak. Uh, and, and hopefully in the, you know, in the years to come, if, if not already, you're seeing more and more of that automated, uh, more of that, that AI, more of that machine learning capability, at the same time, more and more visualization capabilities, so again, the, 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 the work load is not necessarily on the human being to gather the information or to present the information. It's to do, do what humans still do best, right? And that's interpret, right? What is it that we can learn from this information? And then most importantly, how do we act upon this, right? That I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of, one of the things we're going to make sure we're doing from an insights and analytics perspective is providing actionable uh, learnings, right? What do, what do you want me to do about this? What is the what is the thing that you've noted in the information in the data, and then what what actions, what next steps can we take? So I think that's that's the work we we would want the human beings to be doing. So hopefully the computers can uh, make the the, the 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 labor aspects uh, a little bit less laborious, so that again we can we can do the thinking. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really great point. And I think, you know, going back to what you said earlier, it, this is an exciting time to be in our industry. And I think if we go back, you know, five, 10 years ago, where, as you said, surveys would take weeks, sometimes months to execute, we're in a situation now where that timeline has really compressed quite significantly. And I think part of that is in response to the change in the marketplace, the speed at which businesses are run. Um, and I think it's beholden on our industry to, if not keep up, it, is be ahead of being able to help drive business decisions. And so ultimately, if a platform can't do that, if a provider can't do that, it's not meeting those business needs. So it is exciting because we are going to be in a very different marketplace five years from now. Um, thinking about category management and uh, Ferraro in particular, where do you see the company evolving in the next five years and in category management specifically? Sure. So, you know, I think uh, we're, we're going to continue to evolve, uh, you know, as I, as I led with, we're, we're a growth organization. I'd like to, 
uh, see us continuing to drive growth within the categories that we participate in. And I think a big part of that is, again, not just dollar sales growth, although that's, that's of course, important, but uh, also growth of thought process, growth of thought leadership. And that's where, again, uh, continuing to work with partners like Suzy so that we can uh, properly vet the, the, the insights that, that we're developing internally first and then ultimately externally second, I think, uh, I think that's a big part of the role that uh, category management will continue to play uh, here at Carrera. It's interesting and I totally agree. And I think we're all um, as a globe figuring out, you know, where we're going to land in the next two to three years. What do you think um, you as a company, as a brand can do to stay ahead of the curve as we navigate uncertainty, as we don't know how things are going to be unfolding in the next, you know, year to two years sure um and you know it, it goes without saying i'm i'm not a health professional right uh, and uh, i don't I'm, I'm not a doctor and i don't play one on tv uh but you know i think looking at shopper insights um you know i think that we're we're in an interesting and uncharted territory right i think that there uh there are shopper behaviors that uh, existed uh you know pre-2020 uh, that um, have uh, changed for the time being uh, and will probably uh, have evolved uh, by the time we're uh, on, on the other side of this, right? Uh, you know, so I think, um, again, continuing to, to test and learn throughout this time period uh, and to, to be cautious about the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the evident truths, right? That I think that uh, we've we've done a lot of work pre 2019 pre 2020. Uh, you know the the the, the market structure work, the, uh, the the price pack architecture work that it, again is probably going to uh, have evolved over the course of the past two years. And I think we need to be prepared to evolve with that, right? Uh, you know I think this will all lean in uh, on uh, how the the overall retail landscape is is changing, right? That uh, you know, you see the expansion, uh, and depending, of course, the uh, the category or the the, the the business that you're you're talking about of e-commerce, right? So I happen to be within the food and beverage space. Uh, so e-commerce is still uh, very much a growth space. Uh, there there are other categories, of course, where e-commerce is, is much more developed, but therefore a, a prime uh, player, prime uh, prime channel. I think the the development of that space. And then at the same time, changes that are going to be experienced uh, in the in the brick and mortar environment again mean that evolution will continue. We need to be prepared to measure evolution as it is continuing, learn and adapt, uh, so that we can uh, both continue to advocate for uh, the brands and for the categories we participate in, and so that we can continue to be good partners for the the retailers that uh, that we work with. Yeah, and I think part of the equation of learning and adapting is, uh, as you said earlier, access to insights quickly, right? The speed is a big part of that equation, um, you know, which really does go to how insight has changed, you know, in the COVID environment and, and how we've migrated a lot to online learning. Um, anything in that migration to online learning for consumer behavior that you'd like to flag or talk about? You know, I'm thinking quality, the qualitative world moved online in, in COVID. And, you know, a lot of folks may not have done qualitative um, beforehand and are now faced with having to do online. Is there anything that you'd like to point out or suggest or, you know, share in terms of your experiences in making that move? Sure. You know, I, I think it's like a lot of things, right, that, you know, there's there's probably an initial discomfort to new, right, whatever new is. And, uh, you know, there's no different than, um, you know, within the, the e-commerce space. Uh, I, like a lot of people, uh, placed my first uh, personal e-commerce uh, uh, food and beverage purchase uh, uh, during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I think there's initial nerves of how this is going to work out. Am I going to get uh, you know, am I going to get squished bananas or are they going to, you know, substitute out items that I don't want to substitute out? Uh, but then what I found in that experience was largely positive, right? And there's a, a couple of trade-offs, but, you know, I didn't have to drive to the store, which 
uh, at, at best was a, a convenience factor or, or again at the at the peak of the pandemic was a was potentially a, a safety decision right but the point being like I, I tried something new that was online based it's largely worked out and now I think I'm I'm a, a consumer uh, uh, within that space that I've, I've opened up to to the potential of that I think the same can be said for for online uh, online learning online testing right that I imagine that there are a lot of uh, manufacturers or, or retailers that uh, are, are less comfortable with uh, with this testing environment versus another testing environment or again the familiar testing environment and it's it's probably just a question of <laughs> trying new things, right? Um, uh, be, being a bit open-minded, but also testing the, the the outcomes, right? That I think going back and validating that the the learnings that you gathered, um, you know, fit with expectations or or ultimately, um, uh, you know, mirror 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 reality in in some way, shape, or form. I think is is really important because then. Uh, it, and this goes back a little bit to the the, the, the conversation around the, the the credibility of the results. Is again, you you want to be able to demonstrate that uh, you you are putting together credible and trustworthy insights uh, from this platform, from any platform, so that people will continue to trust the the, the next thing that that you're going to um, uh, put forward. Wonderful. Um... I have a, do you have any questions of me, Phil, before we close? Um, I didn't, I, I, I didn't have any prepared, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, I don't. <laughs> No, no worries. I just um, wanted to thank you so much for your time. This has been very wonderful. Um, lots of evolution in our space, and there's going to be continued evolution as we go into the next year to five years to 10 years. Um, so it's always exciting to talk through that and how we navigate that. Um, part of what you shared with us is providing um, confidence and credibility as we migrate to this democratization of access to consumers, right? Which I think as industry professionals, we all have a responsibility and an accountability to make sure that we keep our customers top of mind and make sure our engagements with them are very client centric and um, carefully crafted in a way that we get good data, right? Because I think you use the, the term garbage in, garbage out. You know, our output is only as good as the surveys that we design. And with having, you know, direct access to consumers, um, we do really have a responsibility to make sure we care for that hygiene in working with customers and, and sourcing good quality information. And I think the benefits here are providing a platform for answers quickly so that we can help, you know, um, help you make business decisions in a marketplace that is changing so rapidly. Uh, so I do thank you for your time. And I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add before we close. No, just uh, again, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure. It was an absolute pleasure. Take care. Thank you. Again, thank you very much, Phil, for sharing um, your thoughts and spending time with us today. Uh, I do think one of the things you called out is super important, and that's having a playbook of best practices of research hygiene on how to talk to consumers online and a survey format is very important. Um, ultimately, our goal in designing surveys is to approach them from um, customer-friendly language, so it feels very conversational. Uh, and it's also important that we do apply a filter of some best practices. So please um, reach out to your Suzy customer service rep if you need support or any help with a uh, survey design because ultimately survey design is core um, to getting the type of information you need to generate business results and business learning. Um, I'll leave you with a couple of, you know, best practices or uh, tips and tricks, if you will, um, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of, you know, hygiene for survey construction. Um, if you have any further questions, please, again, don't hesitate to ask anybody um, at the SUSE, on your SUSE team. But ultimately, um, 
one of the fundamental starting points is know your objectives, right? Know what you're trying to learn about. There um, is a tendency in survey research to want to ask a lot of interesting things to know kind of questions. Try to avoid that. We want to be um, as short and concise with the number of questions we ask people, you know, keeping in mind um, uh, consumer or respondent fatigue is a very real thing um, and attention spans are limited. So we have them for a small window of time and we want to be as thoughtful about that window of time so that we get the best quality data. So the longer the surveys are, um, the more tired your respondent gets. So just keep that in mind. Um, here's a couple of other quick tips when asking questions, right? Make sure you're um, using time frames, right, uh, for frequency uh, of either per purchase or usage or consideration. Right? So if we ask these general type questions, um, we're going to get general type responses, right? So we want to be specific about um, time frames. Have you used this within the past four weeks? Have you thought about this in the past week, right? So frame it within a window of time for people to really ground their thinking. Um, so, for example, you don't want to say which of the following stores have you ever shopped at because we've all shopped at, you know, a lot of stores in our lifetime. We want to say, have you shopped at any of these stores in the past year um, is a better way of saying that. Um, or have you visited any of the following stores in the last three months, right? So even better, right? Um, so the closer to the current time, and the um, more grounded in an actual behavior, the better for a respondent. Um, when you're screening for sensitive topics, right, if you're going to be dealing in an industry which, you know, may be somewhat sensitive to consumers at the beginning, ask them if they're comfortable answering questions about that before you get into the survey. Um, I think that's just a, a general best practice. Um, avoid yes, no questions, right? Um, do you own a dishwasher, for example, um, is a yes, no, and people tend to want to be crowd pleasers, if you will. So you want to say, which of the following appliances do you own so that you can get to dishwasher ownership, for example. Um, Phil definitely mentioned this, avoid marketing or business speak. Um, check yourself in terms of the way you talk about your category. Is it the way respondents are going to think about their category? Are we using terms and shorthand or abbreviation or jargon that people on the street just will not know? Um, it happens a lot. For example, um, you know, RTD, right? Um, which of the following RTD beverages do you prefer? Consumers are just not going to know what that is. So you want to translate that into um, everyday language. Um, another one is avoid double-barreled questions, right? You want to make sure that your question is asked only um, in a single-minded fashion. So you're not asking things that can have two, po two possible ways to answer or may confuse people and then provide them with um, a way to answer it if none of the questions apply to them, right? Uh, so you want to avoid double barrel questions and make sure that the, your answer choices if you're asking a closed ended question um, are as comprehensive as possible and give them an opportunity to se select none of the above if um, the, the list is not comprehensive. Um, avoid leading questions, right? This is, this is a tough one to sometimes catch yourself um, at because we know what we're trying to solve for when we're creating a survey, but we want to make sure it's as neutral as possible so people don't feel pressured or there's no social desirability to want to answer a certain way, right? Um, or want to please a brand, for example, um, if it's a brand that they, they love, they may want to answer in a positive way. So you want to be as neutral or as unbiased as you possibly can be um, when you're writing questions. So these are just a few tips and tricks to layer onto the wonderful um, information that Phil shared with us. Thank you and have a wonderful day.